I recall the moments spent on our weathered porch steps, each creek echoing a story of its own, the pain peeling away as if eager to depart, much like Dad. Mom used to quip that he had wheels beneath his feet and a heart too vast for any map. Back then, I couldn't grasp the depth of her words until the day the authorities arrived, bearing news of Dad's deserted truck by some forsaken highway. At seven, I clung to Mom's skirts, unable to comprehend fully but burdened by her silent sorrow. Mom, Jane, a resilient soul, soldiered on in Dad's absence, shouldering double shifts at the local diner. Many nights, I drift to sleep to the rhythm of her return, a futile attempt at stealth. At twelve, I query her exhaustion, to which she replied with fatigued yet gentle eyes, Ella, we must make ends meet. Life's a struggle, but we're tougher, right? I nodded, grasping the concept of resilience, proud to mirror mom's strength. Then came the shattering blow of mom's cancer diagnosis at 18. Despite her fierce battle, it was akin to stemming the tide with a spoon. In her quiet departure, she left me with memories and a stack of debts. College, envisioned as my salvation, proved elusive. I scraped by the first year but found myself adrift thereafter, juggling classes with multiple jobs, grasping at any semblance of financial security. One weary night at the campus library, the weight of the world bore down, and I faltered. Surrounded by towering tomes, I succumbed to despair. Enter John, a beacon of compassion amidst the shadows. With genuine concern, he approached, offering solace in his meager offerings. Half a sandwich, class notes, even his battered laptop. Together, we found solace in conversation or comfortable silence a refuge reminiscent of mom's presence. One day amid our shared moments, John spoke earnestly, Ella, you're the strongest person I know. You'll overcome this, I'm certain. I chuckled ruefully, feeling more like a mere survivor. Yet his words resonated. Strength lay not in defying gravity, but in clinging on despite the urge to let go. In his gaze, I glimpsed truth, realizing he was right. I embody mom's strength. Confident that with or without the metaphorical wheels beneath my feet, I would navigate the challenges of college life. The glossy brochures painted a deceptive picture. Reality was a harsh, greedy landscape that pushed you beyond perceived limits. In my second year, standing in the queue at the financial aid office, anxiety twisted my stomach into knots. The indifferent gaze from the counter attendant made me feel like just another faceless student. As I began explaining my scholarship renewal, she cut me off, disinterestedly declaring the system's verdict. Frustration and helplessness engulfed me as I walked away. It was then that John reappeared. Concern etched on his brow. He asked about my well-being. I admitted the bleakness of my situation with financial aid. John remained silent for a moment before encouraging me not to give up, highlighting my intelligence compared to some professors. Despite the gloom, John's optimism shone through, offering to treat me to coffee. Those coffee breaks multiplied, and John transformed into my confidant, my go-to person at college. His practicality emerged when he suggested seeking an on-campus job to alleviate financial strain. My initial skepticism waned as John recommended the library. You're there anyway, might as well get paid for it, he reasoned. Thus, my employment at the library began a far cry from glamour, but it paid the bills. Juggling book stacks and serving coffee left little time for studies, yet I managed one day at a time. Through these shared challenges, John transitioned from the guy buying me coffee to a true friend, a confident privy to the complexities of my family history. It was during an evening closure at the library that John uttered words that lingered. Ella, you're going to make something of yourself. I just know it, and I'll be here cheering you on, John assured me. His words sparked a warmth within, and I couldn't help but smile. Thanks, John. That means a lot. College presented its challenges, but with John by my side, it felt like I had a fighting chance. He wasn't just a friend. He was a beacon of goodness in this chaotic world. Post-college life took an unexpected turn when John and I decided to tie the knot. Our wedding wasn't a grand fairy tale affair, but a modest courthouse ceremony with a handful of friends, lacking the fanfare. We settled into a tiny apartment with more cracks than walls, yet it symbolized a fresh start, a new chapter in our lives. 
However, a new challenge emerged in the form of John's mother, Mrs. Smith. During her first visit, her disdain for our humble abode was palpable. This is where you live, she remarked, her voice a mix of disbelief and disgust. I attempted to downplay it with a smile, saying it may not be much, but we were happy, unimpressed. She scoffed, insisting that John could do better. The criticisms continued with each visit. Our apartment was too small, the neighborhood not good enough, and why wasn't I cooking more? One evening after she left, frustration boiled over, and I turned to John. Doesn't it bother you the way your mom talks about our like, John? Ever the peacemaker, he shrugged, claiming she was just worried about us and that it was her way of showing love. That's not love, John. That's criticism. There's a difference. I asserted, expressing my frustration at the constant disapproval. I responded sharply, and he fell into a quiet contemplation. It seemed as though he couldn't grasp what was so evident to me. His mother's words were gradually eroding our connection, piece by piece. The situation worsened when she began dropping hints that we should relocate to a more upscale place. Frustration overwhelmed me one day. John, we can't afford some fancy place. Why doesn't she understand that? John looked uneasy, murmuring that his mother only wanted the best for us. I erupted. Maybe we should look at other apartments just to keep her quiet. When are you going to stand up to her? This is our life, not hers. His silence spoke volumes. So we continued in our tiny apartment, shadowed by Mrs. Smith's disapproval like a lingering stench. Despite my love for John, his reluctance to confront his mother created a divide. It felt as if he remained her little boy, not a grown man carving his path in the world. As time progressed, our lives took divergent paths. I landed a demanding job at a marketing firm, relishing the climb up the professional ladder. John, on the other hand, remained in the same managerial role at a local retail store. He appeared content, but I couldn't comprehend his lack of ambition. One night, I'd arrived home late, energized by a successful project. John sat on the couch engrossed in a TV show. Sharing my excitement, I exclaimed about landing a significant account. His response was a grunted acknowledgement. Perplexed, I prodded for enthusiasm, only to receive a somewhat annoyed, of course I am. It's just, it's all you ever talk about. Work, work, work. I sat up, stung by his dismissiveness. Well, sorry for being passionate about my career. What do you want me to do, be like you, satisfied with just getting by? His reaction was swift. What's that supposed to mean? He shot back, his tone defensive. I pressed on. It means, why don't you want more, John? Why are you content just being this? He didn't answer, storming off to bed while I remained on the couch, simmering with hurt and frustration. The tension between us spilled over into every aspect of our lives. Simple conversations became minefields. Then came the day John dropped a bombshell. He wanted us to move to a bigger place, something more befitting our status. I stared at him incredulously. The fitting our status, John. We can't afford a fancy place. We're doing fine here. But he was insistent. But we can't live like this forever, Ella. And my mom keeps saying. I cut him off. Oh, so it's your mom again. When are you going to stop listening to her and start living for us, John? His face flushed red. I'm thinking about our future, Ella. Maybe you should too. His words cut deep. It felt like he didn't see the effort I was pouring into building our future together. It was as if we were on different planets. In the end, we did move to a house that stretched our finances. John seemed happier, but with each rent check I wrote, a part of me screamed in protest. We were living in a house too big, with a gap between us widening. Most nights, I lay awake wondering how we reached this point. Was it the money, our jobs, or had we simply grown too far apart? Just when I thought things couldn't get stranger between us, life threw a curveball. John's dad fell seriously ill, hitting John hard. Our already fragile routine was shattered. One evening, after a particularly rough visit to the hospital, John slumped into a chair, his weariness palpable. Dad's not doing good, Ella. The doctors say he needs constant care. 
I tried to be the supportive wife. I'm so sorry, John. Maybe we can get a nurse to help. I suggested a different approach, but John shook his head, his gaze distant. No, I've been thinking. I'm going to take care of him. I'll quit my job and move in for a while. Stunned, I couldn't help but voice my concerns. Quit your job, John. Are you sure? What about her bills, the rent for this place? His response was sharp. This isn't about money, Ella. It's my dad. I need to be there for him. I stood my ground, torn between understanding and practicality. I get that, John, but we need to think this through. We can find another way to help your dad, I pleaded. Yet he remained resolute. No, my mind's made up. I'm doing this. And so he did. John moved into his parents' place, leaving me alone in our spacious yet empty house. Days turned into weeks with me juggling my job and all our bills, while he... I wasn't even sure what he was doing. Each visit or call revealed the same scene. John glued to his phone or the TV, his frustration palpable, while his mother, Mrs. Smith, hovered with unsolicited advice. One day, I found him sprawled on the couch, a beer in hand, eyes fixed on a game. John, shouldn't you be with your dad? I asked, concern lacing my words. His response was dismissive. He's sleeping. What do you want me to do? Sit and stare at him. I suggested he look for a part-time job to ease our financial strain. The suggestion didn't sit well with him. Really, Ella? You want me to work now while my dad's lying there dying? His mother's timely entrance only fueled the tension. Ella, John is doing a noble thing taking care of his father, she interjected. Grateful, the word stung as it left her lips. I'm keeping our lives afloat while he sits here doing what? Playing caretaker while watching TV and drinking? I couldn't hold back the frustration. The days following John's father's passing were tough. I hoped for a return to normalcy, but it never came. John never returned to work, spending more time at his mother's place, leaving me alone in our expensive house, drowning in bills and loneliness. One evening, I returned home from work to find John and his mother, Mrs. Smith, Sitting in the living room, the atmosphere felt heavy with tension. Ella, we need to talk, John said, not even bothering to meet my gaze. Setting my bag down, I felt a knot form in my stomach. What's going on? Mrs. Smith, always ready with her opinions, began, We've decided it's best if John and I live here. We can take care of the rent now. I was shocked. What? This is our home, John. You can't just kick me out. John finally looked at me, his eyes cold. It's not working, Ella. You and me, this life. I need to start over, and Mom needs a place to stay. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Start over? So you're just going to throw away our marriage like that? He shrugged. It's been over for a while, hasn't it? We're just making it official now. I turned to his mother, enraged. And you? You think you can just come in here and take over my life? Mrs. Smith stood up, her voice sharp. It's for the best, Ella. You and John were never a good match. He needs to be with family now. Fail? What about me? I'm his wife. John stood up, facing me. Not anymore. We want you out, Ella. The sooner, the better. I looked between them, the betrayal cutting deep. Fine, I'll go. But don't think for a second that this is okay. You're both making a huge mistake. I packed a bag with my essentials hands shaking with rage and hurt as I walked out the door. John's voice followed me. We're doing what needs to be done, Ella. You'll see, this is for the best. Settling into my new, modest apartment felt like a fresh start. It was small, but it was a place where I could finally breathe, away from the stifling atmosphere of my past life with John and his overbearing mother. The walls were bare, and the furniture minimal, starkly different from the lavishness I'd left behind. As I arranged my few belongings, my phone buzzed with a message from an old mutual friend. Hey, Ella, have you heard about John and his mom? They're living it up, expensive clothes, fancy gadgets. Wonder where all that money is coming from. I stared at the screen, feeling a mix of curiosity and bitterness. Where were they getting the money? A few days later, I bumped into another friend, Mike, at the grocery store. Ella, you won't believe it. 
I saw John and his mom at the high-end electronics store. They were buying like there's no tomorrow. Heard they even sold their family home. Crazy, huh? I forced a smile. Yeah, crazy. But inside, my mind raced. They sold a family home. Was that where the money was coming from? As I unpacked groceries in my kitchen, a small, unadorned space that was now my refuge, I couldn't shake the feeling of unease. They seemed to be living in a world of luxury built on lies and deceit while I was moving on, building my life again from scratch. Sitting down at my tiny dining table, I let out a long breath. It didn't matter. I told myself that I was finally out of that toxic environment, free from their twisted dynamics. But deep down, I knew the truth. It bothered me. It bothered me that they seemed to be thriving after throwing me to the curb. I had worked hard for everything I had, while they appeared to enjoy a life of ease and comfort. As the evening wore on, I found solace in the quiet of my apartment. It was mine, earned through my own effort and resilience. I had lost much, but I had gained something more valuable, my independence, my sense of self. For months into my new life, the past came knocking in a way I never expected. One lazy Saturday morning, my phone rang and John's name flashed on the caller ID. I hesitated but answered. Hella, we need your help. John's voice was shaky, desperate. I sat up alert, asking what had happened. It's all gone wrong. We got kicked out of the rental house. Mom and I, we have nowhere to go. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Kicked out? But I thought you had money. There was a pause. The money's gone, Ella. Dad left debts, not inheritance. We thought, his voice trailed off. I felt a mix of emotions, shock, disbelief, and a tinge of satisfaction. Were they really posh all this time, hoping for a rich inheritance? Seriously, it was too much, even for my ex-husband. What do you want from me, John? He asked if maybe they could stay with me, just for a while, until they sorted things out. I laughed bitterly. You want to stay with me after everything? Remember the good times, can't we just? I cut him off. Good times, John. You and your mother threw me out of my own home. You can't just come crawling back now that things are tough. He was silent for a moment. I know I messed up, Ella. I'm sorry. We're just really desperate. I took a deep breath, my decision clear. John, I've moved on. I've built a new life, and there's no place for you or your mother in it. You need to figure this out on your own. He pleaded, but I stood firm. No, John, it's over. You made your choice, now live with it. I hung up, my heart pounding. I felt a surge of empowerment mixed with a twinge of sadness. John, the man I once loved, was now just a voice on the other end of the phone, a reminder of a life I had left behind. Later, Laura called me. I heard about John and his mom. Are you okay? I smiled, feeling a sense of peace. Yeah, I'm more than okay. I'm free, Laura, truly free. As I ended the call, I looked around my small apartment, my sanctuary. It was a far cry from the life I had with John. But it was real. It was mine. I had faced the worst and come out stronger. That night, I realized that this was my new beginning. A life where I was in control, where my happiness didn't depend on someone else. I had lost much, but in the process I had found myself. 